Hi guys, it's Ange. So today we're going to talk about a few trials that are, to me, absolutely fascinating. And shockingly, they're all extremely true. The One of the cases that first sparked my interest in medieval trials was the Pope trial. A pope was, a pope died, and a cardinal, I believe, put him on trial after he had already died seven months before. And they unburied him and literally dressed him in his pope clothes and put him on a bench and literally put him on trial the one of the lawyers was said to be screaming at him to answer his questions and so yeah so ecclesiastical trials are are very interesting and there are a few that have sparked my interest we're not talking about the pope trial today we'll get into that another day Today we're going to talk about some that are just interesting. So, the first one is the rats. They put rats on trial. And here is a story. Okay, here we go. The rats were put on trial. And yes, they even had lawyers. Now, everyone is entitled to a fair and just trial. It is a maxim that has applied to the law for centuries. Yet some historical cases show this principle applies to animals as well as humans. A surprising number of animals have been tried throughout history. Most often, it was those who lived alongside humans. Pigs, in particular, were frequently convicted of biting or eating parts of small children and babies. Other unlucky animals involved in a crime would share the punishment of the law with a human perpetrator. Now, sometimes animals would be permitted a lawyer at their trials, and perhaps the most memorable of these cases involves the rats of Otmi in France. Their lawyers showed the world that all creatures, not just man, deserved a fair trial. The small village of Atim faced a disastrous problem in 1508. Rats were pillaging their barley crops, and the villagers were at their wit's end. They took an extraordinary step of making proclamations at several crossroads that the rats were to attend an Episcopal court that would be assembled to hear the villagers' complaints against them. Perhaps not unsurprisingly, the rats did not attend the hearing. Consequently, the prosecutor moved that they should be sentenced to absentia. Now, luckily for the rats, the presiding bishop decided the creatures deserved legal counsel. This this was because the rats would be facing excommunication. Excommunication was the worst possible punishment in the eyes of the clergy. If the court ruled in the villagers' favor, therefore, An appointed Bartholomew Bartholomew Chesnier, who set about the task with a passion. Sadakat Kadri, in his book, The Trial, details how Chesnier pointed out to the court that it wasn't just one or two rats that were being tried here, but a whole host of them. As such, every single rat should be allowed to attend court and make their own representations. 
Now, Chesney added that the rodents were spread so far and wide throughout the area that the summons made by the villagers could not possibly had reached all of the creatures that resided in the diocese. Whether it was his legal arguments that persuaded the court, or whether the judges had a soft spot for animals, is still unknown. But either way, the court agreed with Chesney's argument. It was said that the matter should be adjourned and reheard after proper summons had been issued. The summons was to be preached from every pulpit in Atun. That was ruled to be sufficient to notify every single rat. The priest did as the court instructed and preached the, the summons. The date of the next hearing came around and there were still no rats. Of course they haven't turned up, Chesney declared, because they are in fear of their lives, the tenacious lawyer explained that his clients had ignored the summons because no defendant was obliged to risk his or her life in coming to court, and that applied to rats as well. After all, to get to the place of the trial, the rats would have to come out into the open where cats and dogs would be waiting to pounce on them. As such, their absence for that day was justified. Once again, the judges saw the logic of this. They adjourned the case once more. Unfortunately, here the record ends. There is no note on what happened at the third impossible final hearing. Did the villagers lock away their cats and dogs to give the rodents a fair chance to attend? If they did, was it possible that just one rat attended the place of trial? simply because it emerged at an inopportune time, looking for food? We can only guess. While this case may seem extraordinary, even silly, it did go on to be used as a precedent for a later human trial. In November 1540, when Chesnier was president of the Parliament of Provence, there was a campaign by Catholics against Protestants within France. A dozen Protestant inhabitants of the town of Marindal chose, to, chose not to attend the summons. As a result, the court ordered that the whole town be burned to the ground. Eighty families eight zero, were, were condemned. However, the seigneur of Arles made a powerful speech to Chesnier, reminding him of the submissions he'd made on behalf of the rats. If the rats were to be granted the opportunity to be heard, then seigneur Ar Seignier argued, then surely humans had the right too. Couldn't the imperiled Protestants of Marindal also be allowed safe passage to a fair hearing? Chesnier was so moved by this plea and the appeal to his own case that he not only called off the attempted burning, but also persuaded the, persuaded the King of France to hold off the sentence indefinitely. Now, unfortunately for the inhabitants of Marindal, after Chesnier died, his successor arranged for the sentence to be carried out. In a cruel twist, he offered the townsfolk free passage to Germany, but then reneged and laid waste to the whole town and its inhabitants. The case of the rats of Atun may make many people shake their heads in wonder at the, the idiocy of the law, but it should have the opposite effect. This case should remind us that true justice should be available to all, no matter what their status or species. So, weevils destroy your crops? Pig name your children? 
dying to get back at these creatures. In Europe during the Middle Ages, you could bring them to court where they could face sentences ranging from gruesome mutilation to excommunication, or at least that is what many reports say. Although, although the hard evidence of such legal actions is scant. And somehow, the surreal practice of trying beasts as though they are people continue to this day. The main issue with our understanding of the strange practice, according to Sarah McDougall, associate professor at the John Jay College of Criminal Justice, is the sourcing. The source are the sources are 19th century scholars who didn't bother to give a whole lot of explicit information on where they found this stuff, she says. With a lot of the medieval ones, we know that some of them were either made up or they were textbook cases that were kind of a way to keep students from falling asleep. And an even stranger reasoning for a fake animal court story, McDougal says, that one of the most famous cases of beasts on trial involving a bunch of rats was completely made up just to defame the lawyer who supposedly defended the rats. Even with so much uncertainty about which animal trials were real, McDougall stresses that some did still take place. The most detailed source of a case study, whether real or imagined, we have for the medieval roughly between the 13th and 16th centuries. Practice of putting animals on trial is E.P. Evans' treatise on the subject of criminal punishment and capital punishment of animals, published in 1906. Evan points out two distinct types of animal trials that would occur. There is a sharp line of technical distinction between the former were capital punishments inflicted by secular tribunals upon pigs, cows, horses, and other domestic animals as a penalty for homicide. The latter were judicial proceedings instituted by ecclesiastical courts against rats, mice, locusts, weevils, and other vermin in order to prevent them from devouring the crops and to expel them from orchards, vineyards, and cultivated fields fields by means of exorcism and excommunication. In other words, most large animals were tried for offenses such as murder and generally executed or exiled, while smaller, more diffuse pests and offenders were more often excommunicated or denounced by the church tribunal, but all were thought to have been given their day in court. Evans' book lists about 200 cases in which all creatures, large and small, were brought to trial for a plethora of reasons. Most complaints against smaller animals, leveled for infestation or destruction of crops, ended up in some sort of excommunication from the church or official ecclesiastical denouncement. Evan, Evans explains that this was largely done as an effort to make people feel better about exterminating them since even weevils, slugs, rats, and such were considered God's creatures. The, dev the devastation they inflicted was likely part of his plan, so to just destroy them would be an act against God's will and creatures, of course, if they were tried in a church court and excommunicated or condemned in the case of animals and insects, they could mitigate guilt. One such case in the 1480s saw the Cardinal Bishop of Atoum in France rule against some slugs that were ruining estate grounds under his purview. He ordered three days of gaily processions where the slugs were told to leave the area or be cursed, thus making them free game for exter extermination. A similar case was said to have taken place just a year later. In this case, in the case of larger animals, such as bulls, pigs, dogs, cows, and goats, the offending beasts could, in theory, actually be brought to court to stand trial. The sentences for these animals tended to be more severe. Pigs often got the worst of the human legal system for a simple reason. They were actually killing people, says McDougall. 
In an age where animals were often roaming the streets and children were found in fields, accidents were pretty common. Evans describes a fairly typical case in 1379 in which two herds of swine were feeding together when a trio of pigs became agitated and charged the swine master's son, who died from his injuries. All of the pigs from both herds were tried, and after due process of law, were condemned to death. Somewhat luckily, all but the three instigating pigs were implicated as accomplices and later pardoned. In most cases, the court endeavored to try the animal as closely as it could to the same way humans were tried. This included how they were punished, just like some murderers of the day condemned Condemned animals, again in most cases pigs, were horribly executed for their crimes. Evans described a pig in 1266 that was publicly burnt for the crime of mutilating a child, and another in 1386 that was to be mangled and maimed in the head and forelegs, and then to be hanged for having torn the face and arms off a child. Bestiality was also an occasional accusation that led to the trial of an animal. Although this charge was actually known to go in the animal's favor, both the human and animal might be put to death, but in some cases, they seem to have managed to say that it wasn't the animal's fault, that the animal didn't consent. consent. McDougal says, so the animal just wasn't punished. Still, other animals were imprisoned right along with human criminals. In this case, as no one honestly believed the animal was solemnly considering its actions, the owner was charged for the animal's board as form of secondhand punishment. As barbaric, strange, or just silly as animal trials may seem, they continue well into the modern day. In 1916, an elephant named Mary murdered her trainer and was hanged in Tennessee using a crane. In 2008, in Macedonia, a bear was convicted of stealing honey from the beekeeper. The park services was forced to pay $3,500 in damages. It seems like the human thirst for justice, no matter how irrational or silly, continues to be, to know no bounds. Now, putting a pig on trial appears to defy logic, but in medieval France, it gave rural folk the illusion of order in a frightening world. In December 1457, a sow and her six piglets were arrested in Savigny for the murder of a five-year-old boy. Together with their owner, Jean ba Bailey, they were dragged off to jail, and a month later, they were put on trial before the local judge. According to the court records, three lawyers were present, two for the prosecution, one perhaps for the pig's defense. Nine witnesses were called by, by name, in addition to several others whose identities have been lost based on their testimony. Based on their testimony, the judge, the judge decided that while Bailey should have kept a much more careful eye on his animals, responsibility for the boy's, boy's murder lay squarely with the pigs. The sow had clearly been the ringleader. After consulting with experts in local customary law, the judge solemnly sentenced her to death, stipulating that she should be hanged on a tree by her hind legs. The piglets were a different matter, though. Since there was no direct evidence that they had participated in the murder, the judge decided to let them off on the promise of good behavior. This was a horrifying, surreal episode, but it was far from unique. Animal trials were a remarkably common feature of medieval and early modern justice, especially in France. Although exact numbers are hard to come by, more than a hundred cases 
are known to have taken place between the 10th and 18th century, involving all manner of creatures and crimes. Mules were charged with sodomy, rats and locusts with destroying crops, cockerels with laying eggs, in defiance of their nature, and dogs with theft. But pigs were by far the most common criminals, and in almost every case, they were accused of killing a child. So this is going to be the last animal trial that we talk about today, and it is the rooster that was tried for laying eggs. So, in 1474, a Swiss rooster was put on trial for laying an egg. Nowadays, we have such a fascination of the bizarre and the unknown that no one would probably be surprised if someone said that they saw a UFO or that they have a photo evidence of mythical creatures like the Loch Ness Monster or Bigfoot. But back in the days, people were absolutely terrified of things that were alien to them or that they couldn't begin to fathom which led to this unfortunate trial for a rooster in medieval Switzerland. The rooster was given a public defender. The public defender states, on behalf of the Galatius prisoner, the facts of the case were admitted, but his advocate summoned that no evil animus had been proved against his client, and that no injury to man or beast had resulted. Besides, the laying of an egg was an involuntary act, and as such, not punishable by law. If it was intended to impute the crime of sorcery to his client, he was entitled to an acquittal, for there was no instance on record of Satan having made a compact with one of his of the brute creations. Now that was a good defense strategy, but the prosecutor countered. The prosecutor replied that it was not a case of the devil making a compact with brutes, but that Satan actually entered into them on occasion, and he adduced the case of the gathering swine and the fact that these animals through un involuntary agents like the cock had been punished. Now what happened to the bird? Well, it was still the Middle Ages. But we do have this. An extract from the Chronicle of Basil in the month of August in the year 1474 a cock of this city was accused and convicted of the crime of laying eggs and was condemned to be burnt with one of his eggs in the Cullenberg or public square, where the ceremony took place in the presence of a vast concourse of spectators, that the owner of the unfortunate bird should not have shared his fate is one of those marvels which sorcery alone can explain. So these were all some trials that I found and I thought you guys would like it and I hope to see you all again soon.